You guys are awesome. By the way, how are you anyway? Huh? Everybody doing good? God is good, is he not? You know, there's been a lot of prayers going up for folks, and uh, specifically Dana. And uh, you know, she's doing better. Maybe she's turning the corner. Yeah, yeah. So really blessed to, blessed to know. I was just sharing with one of the ladies back there saying, you know, it's amazing to me that it's one thing that we pray, but another thing that he actually listens to us. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? I mean, the God of the universe, right? He, he, he listens to us and he cares about us and, and each of our individual needs. And that's just humbling, I think, you know. Anyway, good to see you. Good to be here. Uh, let's stand together. We'll get started by doing that. We're going to do a few jumping jacks and some stretches and... No, I'm kidding. I'm not really up to that either, so anyway, good to see you. And uh, we're going to read this morning from Psalms, Psalm number 33, a couple of verses, verse 22, 20 through 22. This is really a good one, um, especially in light of um, us who may be going through difficult times, maybe. I know that never happens to any of us, but uh, just in case it does, this is a good one. Let's read it together. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart shall rejoice in him, because we have trusted in his holy name. Let your mercy, O Lord, be upon us, just as we hope in you. Heavenly Father, this morning as we read these words, we are reminded of your greatness. We're reminded, Lord that you look upon us with affection, that you love us as your children, that we are in the palm of your hands. And because of that, Lord, our hearts can rejoice this morning because we have confidence in you, in the power of your name. And we thank you, Lord, that you hear us when we pray. And as we pray this morning, as we worship this morning, we do it, Lord, to glorify you we do it to draw close to you. Our desire is to experience your love in our lives, in our church, in this building. Holy Spirit, we pray that you fill it with your love. We thank you so much for the great blessings that you give us. And Lord, we want to commit this time of worship to you. May we clear our minds of our burdens and lay them at your feet. Oh, Lord, if only for a few moments that we might draw close to you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Christ, I think about your sacrifice. You became nothing, poured out to death. Many times I've wondered at your gift of life. I'm in that place once again. in that place once again once again I look upon the cross where you die I'm humbled by your mercy and I'm broken inside once again I thank you once again I pour out my life Exalted to the highest place, King of the heavens, where one day I'll bow. But for now, I marvel at the saving grace, mindful of praise once again. Mindful of praise once again. Once again I look upon the cross where you die. I'm humbled by your mercy and I'm broken inside. Once again I thank you. Once again I pour out my life. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross, my friend. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross, my friend. Once again, I look up where you died I'm humbled by your mercy and I'm broken inside once again I thank you once again I pour out my life thank you for the cross thank you for the you for the cross, my friend. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross, my friend. Words cannot express how great your love is for us. You demonstrated it to us by laying your life down in our place. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for what you accomplished on the cross, that you brought us back to our Father. You reunited us. And now you've given us a path to heaven and Lord, we are just so blessed and honored and humbled by that. So Father, now as we move to open your word, Holy Spirit, we just ask that you would speak to our hearts this morning and encourage us for the hope that we have in you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Please open your Bibles to the book of Revelation, chapter 4. So the last several weeks, we've been looking at these letters that uh, were written to the different churches, representative of the church at large throughout history. And we've learned a lot, really, from these different churches and the way they behaved, if you will, what type of spirit was there. And, you know, there was a really, really important reason why these letters were written to the churches. It's important for us to remember that before Jesus ascended into heaven, before he went to the cross, he made a promise to you and me, all of us who believe, that he would send the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit, he, the Holy Spirit, would rest upon the bride of Christ, would rest upon the church, be there to guide us, grow us up, direct our paths, accomplish God's will. And as in most things in history, there are certain periods of time in which things take place. And in the I don't know, I don't want to use the word schedule or calendar, or I would rather say the plan of God. There's a specific period of time that was set apart in history for us, for the church, for the bride. That particular time in history will come to a conclusion. There will be an end to the age of grace. There will be an end to the time that the church, the bride, dwells on the earth. This morning, it's really, really exciting, and it's really awesome to be able to look at chapter 4. Chapter 4 is a very transitional chapter. Chapter 4 and 5. This morning, we're going to focus on chapter 4. But what we have in these two chapters is actually a picture of heaven. Have you ever wondered about that? Have you ever wondered what heaven looks like? What the throne looks like? What it might be like when we're there in person to see that? You know you will be. You believe that? Boy, there should be some excitement going on here. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I can take it or leave it. I think I'd rather take it. These chapters are providing a transition, if you will, in the book. We're transitioning now from the church age to the opening of the seven seals of judgment, which are going to begin in chapter 6. That's why these two chapters are so very, very important for us this morning. You might remember in the beginning of the letters we started that John was exiled on this island of Patmos, and he was put there because they couldn't keep him quiet about the gospel. He couldn't help it. You know, when I look at what John went through and, and what they tried to do to him to silence him, it's almost embarrassing at times when I think to myself, why, why can't I have that kind of fire? Why can't I not be silenced? Why can't we? Why is it that we, we, we want that fire? We want that fervent desire to share the good news. And sometimes we have a difficult time reaching that. But John was exiled. What an example we have with John, that he would be willing literally to lay down everything in his life for Jesus, to put everything to the side for Jesus, to put Jesus on top of everything else. 
And I think that a lot of times, especially in the time that we're living in right now, sometimes people have a tendency to uh, like to put Jesus perhaps on the top, but it depends on a lot of stuff that's going on underneath. Sometimes the stuff that's going on underneath gets put up top. And our relationship kind of gets topsy-turvy and we start getting weak spiritually because we don't have our priorities right. But John is a really good example. And we read in the beginning of the letter, in chapter 1, and uh, verse 17, that he had a vision on the island of Patmos. And it's very important for us to remember at this point that he is on the earth. He's on the island of Patmos. And the Lord Jesus himself appears to him there on the island. He has a vision. He's given the letters to the seven churches while he's on the island of Patmos. But when we get to chapter 4, something amazing happens. Something utterly amazing. Let's start reading it in verse 1. It says, After these things I looked, and behold, a door open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after these things. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardis stone in appearance, And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. And around the throne were 24 thrones. And on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes. And they had crowns of gold on their head. And from the throne proceeded lightning and thundering and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in the front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. And the second living creature like a calf. The third living creature had the face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. These four living creatures each had six wings. They were full of eyes all around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures gave glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. Wow. Pretty wild, isn't it? We're going to get into some really exciting stuff. Um, we're going to have a picture that's going to come up here in a minute that you, you can kind of ponder while we're, while we're studying together. How can you imagine such a, a, a thing that's being described here? People have tried to imagine it. People have made pictures, painted pictures and things of it to try to give us an idea. This picture is pretty accurate. There was a lot of them to choose from. And I picked this one because I thought that it really depicted what we just read. You can see the elders around the throne and the four creatures and all the angels in the background that are worshiping him and, and the throne and the glory of it. Very powerful. Very powerful. So... John is on this island. He's just received these letters to the churches. And suddenly, he looks up and he says, I saw like a door open in heaven. An open door. 
An open door. When, I, when we read the word, the open door, you know, it indicates something. It indicates access. Access to heaven. The door. And when we look at this particular door, it's standing open in heaven. Now, you might remember one of the letters that we studied, Jesus was saying, I'm standing at the door and I'm knocking. If you let me in, I'll come in and I'll abide with you. Well, that's a different door. That was the door to the church. That was a door to his presence within the church. This is the door of heaven. It's not a gate. Peter's not there at the gate. It's a door standing open. This is the only portion of this book that describes such a place. Until we get to chapter 19, which is towards the end of the whole revelation. And in, the chap- in chapter 19, there's another door that opens up. In chapter 19, during the tribulation period, he said he saw another door opened. And these horses came, that had riders on them. And, and we'll study that later as we get down through here. But there's only two mentions of this door in heaven. And the beautiful thing about this, it opens at this moment, and then apparently, after this moment, it closes. And it remains shut throughout the whole tribulation period until the end, and then it opens again. Very, very thought-provoking. Many people have said over the years, you know... I do believe that we're all, you know, the church is going to be delivered from the wrath of God. And the church will be taken out. But you know what? I'm not really walking with the Lord right now. I might not be included in that group. Oh, I believe in everything, but I'm just not really serving the Lord like I should be, many would say. But you know, when the, when the church is taken and when the tribulation starts, that's when I'm going to buckle down and serve the Lord. You know, if you can't serve Him right now, how are you going to serve Him when your life's on the line? How are you going to serve Him when the Holy Spirit has been removed with the bride? How are you going to serve Him when we're no longer under the age of grace? It's going to be very, very difficult. And there will be those who do. Those who will be willing to lay down their lives during that time for their faith. Now, John tells us in this verse that he hears this voice speaking to him like a trumpet. There's a lot of trumpet talk, if you will. Trumpets are... You know, it's not like a band up there or anything. It's a trumpet is something that signals an event. It's something that tells people what is about to come. If you're in the military and you get up in the morning, you hear the trumpet blow reveille. And you know what that means. It means get up, time to get to work. And at night when your day is over, There's a trumpet that blows that tells you it's time now to rest. There's one that blows that tells you to attack. One to retreat. Many kinds of trumpets. And in the book of Revelation, it's much the same. There are many trumpets. This particular trumpet is very interesting because he hears hears this voice speaking to him, and it sounds like, a trumpet. Now, it's really important that as we go through here that you remember the word like. Okay? When he's, it doesn't mean that it's a trumpet, per se, but John is perceiving it like a trumpet. Sometimes there's just things you can't really describe, can't really explain. We do our best. But, you know, you'll say, well, you know, it was like a herd of buffalo coming through the building. Well, there really wasn't a herd of buffalo, but you just say it was like a herd of buffalo to try to express what had taken place. And John's doing much the same here. He said it was like a trumpet saying to me, come up here. Come up here. 
I want to show you things which must take place after these things. The invitation to come up suggests to us that John was transported in a moment in the twinkling of an eye from the island of Patmos to the very throne room of God. Now, it's important for us to remember also as we study these things that the Old Testament has a huge role to play in understanding the things that we're going to be looking at. Everything in the temple, the temple itself, its design, the way it was built, all of the instruments within the temple were all pictures of what God was going to do through His Son, Jesus Christ, to bring us back to Him. It was all a shadow. And in Christ, all of those shadows are fulfilled. And so as we look down at our description this morning, we're going to see some Old Testament type references of which we need to kind of glance at in order to understand the shadow that was happening in the Old Testament pointing to the authentic thing that was going on in heaven. Did you know that when, when Moses built the temple, that every measurement, every thing used to build it, all the materials, they were all given by instruction to God, to Moses. The temple basically was a model, if you will, of the throne room of God. And there were three parts to the temple, and we'll look at that more as we go through here. There was the inner court, which we called the Holy of Holies. And then there was the, uh, there was the Holy of Holies, and then there was the inner court, and then there was the outer court. Three separate sections of this temple. Important for us to understand why there were three sections of the temple. We'll read in the book of Revelation that the outer court is given over to the Gentiles. So in a Jewish lingo, that would mean Gentiles are allowed to go into the outer courts of the temple, which they did. And then there was the inner court of the temple where only Jewish men were allowed to go. And then there was the Holy of Holies in which only the priest, the high priest, was able to go. It was a place where God's presence dwelt in the Holy of Holies. I would liken it to my physical makeup, actually. I have an outer court. It's my body. And you know, sometimes a lot of people allow a lot of things into their outer court, don't they? Various things. And I also have an inner court. It's my mind. It's my emotions. The thinking processes that go on there. It's to be kind of a, it's to be a, a special place, a holy place. And then I have the holy of holies. I have my spirit. That's where God dwells in you and me, is in our spirit. Not in your mind, in your spirit. And we're able to use our mind and our emotions to try to relate to what's going on in our spirit and express it. But it's no accident that the Bible says that you were made in God's image. It's no accident that the Bible was made in three particular uh, sections, if you will, but it made up one temple. Mine and your three sections make up one temple. And the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, they make up one God. These are all interconnected with one another. Important for us to understand. He says, come up here because I want to show you what's going to take place after this, after these things. He's going to give him like a panoramic widescreen view of the future from heaven's perspective. You see, our perspective on the earth is very different from God's perspective from heaven. And John here is able to get that perspective from heaven to show him 
What is going to happen in the near future after these things? Yeah, I keep saying that, after these things. He tells us once, at once I was in the Spirit, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. I was transported into the throne room of God. Many will look at this and they will say, that is a picture of the rapture of the church. Why is it a picture of the rapture of the church? Well, because it takes place in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. It takes place right after the things of the church. It takes place before the judgments begin. You see, the book of Revelation is really broken down into three parts. The things that took place on Patmos, the time of the church, and the things after the time of the church. That's a simple outline for this book. It's not too confusing, pretty easy to grasp, but he's having this vision of heaven. There's other times in the book of Revelation where John was talking about being in the Spirit, and and that was in chapter 1 when Jesus appeared to him. And again, he'll say it in chapter 21. He'll say, I was carried away in the Spirit. But this particular chapter right here is really important for you and I this morning. Back in chapter 1, verse 19, Jesus said, write down what you have seen what is now and what will take place after these things. Those are your three divisions. So what were the things uh, that you have seen? Well, it was his experience on Patmos. It was his vision of Christ on Patmos. What are the things that are now? The things that are now are the letters to the church, the church age, the things that are now. And then what are the things that will take place after these things? Well, that encompasses the rest of the book of Revelation. And that's what we're going to begin to look at. What John had seen was that beautiful revelation in chapter 1. The things that were now were letters to the churches. And the things that will take place refer to the events at the end of the age And the beginning of the great tribulation from chapter 6 all the way to chapter 22. So most of the book encompasses, it describes, it talks to us about the things that will take place during the great tribulation. Now, many people have many stances, beliefs, whatever you want to call it, concerning these topics that we're going to talk about. And we've mentioned it a few times. Calvary Chapel holds to the idea that the church will be raptured before the Great Tribulation. We hold on to the idea that the rapture will not take place in the midst of the Tribulation, and it will not take place after the Great Tribulation. This picture of John being called up to heaven, he was invited to heaven, which we can view as a picture of the church being called up to heaven. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 52, it says, in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. And again, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it says, The Lord himself, he will descend. He'll come down from heaven with a loud shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And after that, we who are still alive and remain, we will be caught up together. Listen to that. In the the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And from that time, we will always be with the Lord. You know, that should give you tingles. That should really excite you. 
It should make you think to yourselves, wow, I need to take advantage of every moment I have walking with the Lord while I'm still here to fulfill his will. Now, the words after these things, a Greek word for that is called metatauta. That's the Greek word. It's used twice in this verse. And it means the things that take place after the things of the church, which would mean from chapter 6 on. Paul, in his letter to the Thessalonians, tells us that there is a power, a force. Well, it's more than that, actually. Paul says it's a he. He, the restrainer, which we believe to be the Holy Spirit, who rests upon the church. The restrainer right now is actively preventing the Antichrist from revealing himself. And when he is moved out of the way, when he is removed from the earth, then the Antichrist will appear. It's the Holy Spirit restraining him right now, in this moment in time. It is he, the Holy Spirit, that rests upon the church. He is is intricately connected to you and me. And when he's removed from the earth, we're removed from the earth. We don't go anywhere without the Holy Spirit. And once the Holy Spirit removes us and himself from the earth, that will open the door for the Antichrist to come on the scene. That will open the door for the Antichrist to make a treaty to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. And a lot of you might know this morning that, you know, there's a lot of people really uh, in the Jewish world that are really excited about this event taking place. They want that temple rebuilt. You know, for 2,000 years, they haven't really been able to do sacrifice the way God told them to. They can't shed the blood of innocent animals. They don't have a place to do it. And by the way, when that day does come and they're able to build the temple, I can't quite imagine what all the animal activists are going to be doing Right? They're going to be flipping out. As a matter of fact, I think it's going to help to feed some of the persecution that's going to come upon the Jews. But today, in our day right now, they don't have that ability to do so because there is no temple. The temple will not be rebuilt. The treaty will not be made yet because it's being made through the Antichrist. And the Antichrist can't be revealed until the Holy Spirit removes that restraining force which is you and me, the church. So he's allowed into heaven. By the way, the word church, another interesting fact here. We'll read about the word church in chapter 3 as the letters are written to the different churches. And we'll read about the church uh, in the book of uh, Thessalonians and Corinthians. But when we get to chapter 6 you will no longer see the word church. It's not there. Why is the word church not there? Because the church isn't there. It's in heaven. The word church doesn't come again until the very end of the book. When the tribulation period is over and all the judgments have come to pass, then the church is mentioned again. Oh, the word saints is there but not the word church, not the bride. You see how unique and special we are? We are the bride. We're not, we are saints, but we're not just saints, we're the bride. And the saints will speak of all of those who have given their lives to Christ during that horrible period on the earth. They will be the saints, they will be persecuted, they will be murdered. Now, there's a lot of ideas floating around that you and I are going to go through that. There's a lot of ideas going around that we don't have really any chance that we're going to have to go through it. But let me tell you something. The Bible says this. 
You and I are not appointed to wrath, but to obtain salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Also, the book of Revelation says that as these judgments are being poured out, there won't be one person on this planet that is not affected by those judgments. It's God's wrath. It's going to be poured out on every single person on the planet. If you're here on the planet, you're going to suffer God's wrath. Now, if the bride of Christ is here during that time, think about that. Are we going to suffer the wrath of God? Because no one will be insulated from it. No one will be able to run from it. And if you and I are here during the tribulation period, I would have during the judgment period, I would have to wonder, what was the crucifixion all about? I thought, I thought that God's wrath that I deserve was poured out on Jesus on the cross. I thought that his, his justice was satisfied by doing that. And if that's true this morning, why would you have to go through his wrath? You've been delivered from his wrath by Jesus Christ. You see, it's really easy to pick and pull and twist and make the Bible say perhaps something that you might want it to say. But when you run these things to their end, there's really no logical conclusion to that. To me, that would say that Jesus didn't finish the job. But you know what I read in the Bible when he was on the cross? He said, it's finished. I finished the job. His wrath that you deserved was placed upon him. And never, ever in the eternity future will you experience his wrath. Now, you may experience his discipline. You may be paddled a few times by the Lord. It happens. We're children. We make mistakes. Sometimes we make them on purpose. And because we are his children, he will punish us. He will discipline us. You know, Ezekiel, Isaiah, and Daniel, all three of them were able to look into heaven. They were all able to stand upon the earth and get a glimpse into heaven, just like John. But there's something more going on here than that. John is not only getting a glimpse of heaven, he's taken into heaven. None of these others were ever taken into heaven. This is above and beyond any other experiences that men had had up to this point. He's not only taken to heaven and summons to heaven, but now he's going to experience this. Amazing. Immediately, he says, I was in the spirit. And he says, there was one sitting on the throne. Now, interesting, he doesn't say, and I saw Jesus sitting on the throne. He doesn't really call him by name until we get down here a little bit further. But it says, he who sat on the throne was like Jasper, and a Sardis stone in appearance. Remember, in appearance. It doesn't mean that he's a rock. It doesn't mean that he's a gem. It means that in appearance, he had this glow, this glory that looked like a Jasper stone and a Sardis stone. And there was a rainbow around the throne. And look at, in appearance, it was like an emerald. So important that we remember these things, that we distinguish what's going on here. Beautiful picture of the throne. Now, the Bible talks about having open, opening my eyes, opening our eyes, being able to see spiritual things and understand spiritual things. And you know, the way we're built, our vision is very, very limited. Uh, as a matter of fact, you're getting blurrier and blurrier every week. <clears throat> but there are spectrums of light that you're unable to see. There are things around you right now that you cannot see with your natural eyes. There's microwaves going through, radio waves going through, web things going. There's so much information flowing through here and through you and all around us. If we were to be able to see it, we would probably freak out. 
But when we get our new bodies, when we're changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye and we're metamorphosized into an eternal being, we're going to have new vision. We're going to be able to see things that we weren't able to see here on the earth. And I believe that that includes spectrums of light that we cannot see. And I believe that John is seeing that here, trying to describe it to us. Now, around this throne, there were 24 elders and 24 thrones. These 24 elders were sitting on the thrones around the the throne there. And interesting about these elders, they were clothed in white. That sounds familiar to us, doesn't it? They were clothed in white because white robes represent righteousness and holiness. The Bible tells us that as believers in Jesus Christ, we're clothed in white robes also. We're clothed in God's righteousness, in the righteousness of Jesus that was made available to you because of what he did on the cross. These elders are clothed in white robes, and they all have crowns of gold on their heads, which speaks of purity But here's the question, who in the heck are they? Are they angels? You know, the number 24, I think, here is very significant. Uh, Why are there 24 of them? Well, that's a darn good question. But the identification of this group in heaven is really, really important. Now, in the Old Testament, there were 24... uh, times in which priests would come and minister. They would come in rotation, if you will. We read about that a little bit in the story where uh, Zacharias is called to come and minister to the temple. The man waited his whole life for this opportunity to do this. And again, and he was able to come and do this. And again, we remember that everything that happened in the Old Testament was a shadow of the New Testament. So in the New Testament, we see all those things fulfilled that was happening in the Old Testament. Some would say, well, this can't be angels because it tells us that there are angels all around in the setting right here. Are they special created beings? I don't think so. When you notice what they're dressed in, I think it gives us a real good idea of who they are. Now, elders in our time, we think of elders as leaders in the church, protectors in the church, Teachers, people who lead, church age people. Perhaps these elders represent the completeness of the body, the completeness of the church in heaven at that moment. You see, they have these white robes, which is really significant. They have crowns of gold on their head. And these things we are told that the believers will receive. These things we're told by Jesus. This will be, you know, do you know that every single one of you will receive a crown? At least one. If you're born again this morning, you're going to receive the crown of life. And you know what? If you lay your life down and you die for Christ, you're going to receive a martyr's crown. And you serve as a minister for Jesus, you're going to receive that crown. I believe there's five altogether. And each one of these elders around these 24 elders sitting here, they all have these crowns on. Many believe that they represent the complete, total unity of the body of Christ. There were 12 tribes, Jewish speaking. There were 12 apostles, making up 24. You know, there's a lot of Jewish folks that come to know Jesus. And a lot more will. Perhaps this is inclusive of the Jews and the Gentiles being one church now in heaven. Surrounded, surrounding, I should say, the throne of God. And from the throne proceeds lightning and thunder and voices. You know, when I read that, it brought me back to Moses going up on Sinai. 
it brought me back to the description that he gives us when he goes up to the mountain and he tells us, man, there was fire and thunder and lightning and it was really, really intimidating, and really powerful. You bow down, you humble yourself before it, it's overwhelming. There's several other times in the Bible where we're going to see in the book of Revelation this thundering and this lightning effect going on. And each time that it's presented in the book of Revelation, it's, do, it's there to open up into a new section, a new part of the Revelation. And here we have a new part of the Revelation. So thus we see these thunderings and these lightning, important events. We'll see it in chapter 8. We'll see it in chapter 11. We'll see it in chapter 16. It was designed to get your attention. And before the throne, not only is there thunder and lightning, but there's these burning lampstands, seven of them, lampstands of fire, and they're burning before the throne. It says that they're the seven spirits of God. Now, you might remember earlier when uh, John was on Patmos that those seven lampstands were on the earth with him. He saw them in the vision. He said some of the, in one point, he said that those were the churches, those represented the churches. And, and, and then also the seven spirits of God, the seven spirits of the churches were there. Now here, he calls them the seven spirits of God. Are there seven spirits of God? No, there's only one. But remember what seven means. It means completeness. It, it, it means perfection. Perfection. It's not a reference to seven created beings. It's a reference that the Holy Spirit's work in the church is complete. Nothing left out. He'll finish the job. The number seven is so important. When we get to Revelation 5, we'll find the lamb standing in the center, circled around by uh, these creatures they have seven horns, they have seven eyes, and they're the seven spirits of God who have been sent out into all the earth. Very, very cool. <laughs> I could read this over and over and over again because every time I do, I get this new like little picture of what's going on. One little thing I want to add here before we move on. Because when, when John was on the island and he saw these lampstands and, and, and he saw these, this vision, the church was dwelling on the earth. But now that he's been translated up into heaven, where do we find these lampstands? Well, we find them at the throne of God. We find them in heaven. We find the spirit of the seven churches in heaven. We find the elders of the churches in heaven. And it would be very, very easy to understand that that means we'll be there too. We will be there before the throne. Verse 6, before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal. In the Old Testament there was this big giant tub, if you will. It was huge and it was filled with water. And the priests would use it to cleanse themselves before they would go do sacrifices. You can imagine all the priests around this, this big giant tub, if you will, made of bronze, and they're all washing themselves, and they're going through all the rituals, and the water's kind of rippling, and, you know, it's, it's they're, they're cleansing themselves into this water. And here we say the same thing in heaven, but it's as smooth as glass. That tells me there's no reason anymore for them to do that. That it's been atoned for. The price has been paid. That we are now righteous before the Lord because of what he's done for us. And this, and as a matter of fact, in the Old Testament, this thing is called the sea. This particular thing. It's outside of the temple. It's a place where before sacrifices were done that the priests would come and cleanse themselves. No need for that anymore. We've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, and therefore the water is, is still as glass. A fulfillment 
of another Old Testament shadow. And then there's these four living creatures full of eyes in the front and the back. We don't get a very good picture of them here because of, how in the heck can you draw a picture of this? The first one's like a lion. The second one's like a calf. The third living creature had the face of a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. Very interesting. Now these creatures are mentioned several times in the Bible. And we're going to have more encounters with them as we go through. More of a description of them. The four living creatures had six wings. Each one of them have six wings. And each one were full of eyes around and within. And they don't rest day or night. Of course, there's no time in heaven. There's just eternity. And these creatures, amazing creatures, you can read about them in the book of Ezekiel, also in chapter 1, if you would like to go there in your spare time and read it. It talks all about them and what they look like and how they move. And we get to see the fire and the thunder and all the stuff again in Ezekiel when he sees this vision. Some would say it wasn't a vision. Some would say it was an appearance rather than a vision, which I tend to believe. But we have these beautiful creatures, these four creatures. Now, these creatures mentioned are also the ones who will, when John will ask, he will say, who are the multitude of all of these people that are here? Later on in chapter 5. And it's the creatures that will answer him, and he will tell them these are the ones that died during the tribulation period. Totally separate group from the bride. And he will point out who they are. They praise God day and night. Holy, holy, holy. Do you think he says it three times because of the Trinity? Well, some would say that. Do you think he says it three times to put emphasis upon God's holiness? Some would say that. I told you when we started the book of Revelation that I was going to give you some things to choose from. None of them are salvation issues. Many of them are opinions, including the rapture of the church including holy, holy, holy. Sometimes Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, Truly, this is serious, pay attention. Other times Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you. You really need to pay attention when it's there twice. But never is it repeated three times. Only here. Only when it comes to the holiness of God is it repeated three times for emphasis on God's holiness. Lord God Almighty. If this is in reference to the Trinity, it speaks of one Lord God Almighty. And let me ask you this. Who is the one who was and is and is to come? Who is that? Is it not Jesus himself? Are these four creatures attributing deity to Jesus Christ, the Lord God Almighty? I believe so. And whenever these living creatures would give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne who lives forever and ever, at the same moment, all of those elders would fall down before the throne and they would worship him. And look, it says this a couple different times. Whenever the creatures would give glory and honor and thanks to who? To him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever. The 24 elders would fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. And they would cast their crowns before the throne saying, you're worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things all things. And by your will, they exist and were created. By God's will. For his pleasure, they were created. You were created for his pleasure. We were created that we might have relationship with him. Not just a religious experience. Now I do, I got a couple minutes left here. I want to 
mention a couple of things about these creatures, these four creatures, because the description of them is really, really amazing. They have... Ezekiel tells us that each one of them has these four faces. And many would say that these faces represent the Gospels in the New Testament. Pretty impressive. Now, if that were true, then it would be an amazing thing. The first creature was like a lion. Who's the lion of the tribe of Judah? Jesus. And you know what Matthew's main focus is in his book? To show that Jesus was the lion of the tribe of Judah. To show that he fulfilled all the prophecies concerning the lion of the tribe of Judah. The next living creature was like a calf or an oxen, which is a creature of service, a creature of labor, burden. That's what Jesus was, wasn't he? Mark depicts him in that way. He depicts him as the suffering servant. And when we get to the Gospel of Luke, he's pictured like a man. Luke was a physician, remember? Luke saw, Luke's Gospel presents Jesus in his humanity to us. And of course, when we get to the Gospel of John, he's, a, he's the eagle. Now, is that just coincidence? Or was that masterfully woven together by the Holy Spirit? I don't know. I just think it's pretty interesting. I think it's pretty cool that we can connect all of these things together. And they're, and they're not only awesome in their appearance. They're not only covered with eyes, which would speak of the fact that they, they're able, God is able to see everything, everywhere, at all times. He's omnipresent. He's omniscient. He sees all things, even our hearts. They're also great worship leaders because what they do day and night, they proclaim God's holiness. They worship the Lord. And every time they do, the church falls down and we cast our crowns before the throne and we agree with them. Holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. When we get into chapter 5, the same experience is going to be continuing, part two. It gets even more exciting. I would encourage you to read ahead if you can. Maybe you'll come back really confused. <laughs> Maybe you'll come back mem mesmerized. But you know, here's the bottom line. We have a wonderful picture here of us in the presence of the Lord in heaven witnessing it, observing it, experiencing it together. You know, when we worship together, when we sing or when we pray, it can be pretty darn awesome. There can be emotion there. There can be spiritual fire going on there. There can be peace going on there. But it's nothing compared to what's going to happen when we get there. It's going to be the ultimate expression of worship. It's going to be the very thing that we've longed for. With nothing in the way. No negative thoughts, no problems, no burdens. Just in the presence of God. And you know, there's only one requirement to attend this one. And that's to know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. To give your heart and your life to Him. I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about membership, baptism. I'm talking about knowing Jesus just like you know your children or your parents or your friends. A personal, tangible relationship. It's not about being perfect. It's about relationship. And I want to encourage you this morning. Only you know. Well, not only you, but the Lord knows too where you are 
with him. And if you need some adjustment, if your compass is off just a little bit, maybe today's a good day to get back on track. You guys want to come on up? We're going to wrap things up here. So let me encourage you to be able to do that. I'm going to pray right now to close this out, and then I just want to share one more thing with you guys before we uh, finish up in worship this morning. Father, we are so thankful today that we are able to look at these things. And I just pray, Lord, that as, uh, as we went through these this morning, that we were able to get a grasp, at least a little bit, of how awesome you are and what a great future we have with you and in you. And Lord, I pray that this hope that we're reading about, that's all about us and you, that we can carry it out of here with us, that we can have it during every day of our lives, no matter what's going on, that that can be the overriding power in our lives. We are yours. And we love you. And we long to see you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, now, before I sit down, I just have something I want to share with you, and it's really something that is from my heart, and so I hope that you will accept it in that way. You know, we're living in a time right now where a lot of things are being politicized, and a lot of the things that are going on in our culture and in our country right now are causing a lot of division among people. And a lot of that division is coming from medical issues. A lot of that division is coming from mask or not mask, vaccine or not vaccine. And I happen to know for a fact that there are people that are leaving churches because this has driven a wedge into the body of Christ. There are those who are pro-vaccine, those who are not. And those who get it are evil, and those who don't aren't cooperating. And there's division. Can I just encourage you for a second? Don't let that creep in here. Okay? Please. Let's protect this church. You know what? If somebody wants to get a vaccine, that's their business, not yours. And if you judge them for that, you are wrong. And if you don't, and if you, and if you, and the other side is just as true. If you don't want to get one, that's your business. And you shouldn't be judged for that either. We are to love one another. We are to encourage one another. And I'm going to ask you today to please pray for our church. Because it's an infection that can affect us. And we don't want that, do we? Whatever you choose to do, you need to pray about that, and you do that. But you know who's really in charge this morning? Jesus. Amen? Thank you, guys. Oh, and one more thing. I'm sorry. Many of you have approached me and asked me to sign documents saying that you can't get the vaccine because of religious reasons. I can't find any of those, to tell you the truth. But I do have something that you can use, and it's provided by the Oregon Health organization that you can fill out and you can express your feelings about it and send it in. So it's available out there on the back table if you want one. For those of you who are employed and may be threatened by losing your job, if you choose to do that again, that's your choice and that's your business. But I just wanted to let you know, it's not that I don't care, okay? It's just that I cannot honestly find anything here that tells me I shouldn't do that. I feel like I'd be misrepresenting my calling. So if you want to do that, they're back there. They're for you to take, okay? God bless you. I love you, and that's the only reason I'm telling you these things this morning. Okay? Thank you. God bless you. So we're going to do something a little bit different. Our uh, drummer extraordinaire is doing double duty today on sound, and uh, so we'll do one song normal, and second song will be more of an unplugged feel. I also want to uh, 
recognize uh, the worship team here. We've got uh, Sherry on piano and vocal and Kelly on bass. And these guys, and Glenn, as I mentioned earlier, uh, these folks are absolutely uh, consistent and uh, incredible servants for the Lord and for this congregation. And could you please join me in thanking them for their service yeah. to us? All right, let's go. I will, uh, we will take that under advisement.
start the season of fall, let us uh, continue to uh, be so appreciative and love you and worship you. We are your children. You take great care of us. We love our congregation. We love those folks that we get to be with when we get to be in your house. Just please continue to watch over us, protect us, and bless us as you see. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed.